Tyler Pauly. Oh, there we go. Um, I'm the resident consultant for Connect Plus, um, who is our client located outside of London in the UK. And you're attending Tunnels. Oh, sorry, I didn't start it. There we go. You're attending Tunnels and m and &E Inspections, a case study of the Connect Plus implementation in the UK. Um, you guys all hear me all right? Okay. Is this better? I mean, can you hear me? That's, that's what it is. All right. Um, so Connect Plus are utilizing a variety of modules, but today I'm going to give you an overview of how they're using the Bridge Inspector module to handle their tunnel and m and &E inspections. And, um, I've been with Agile Assets for a little over three years now, uh, two of those on site with uh, Connect Plus in the UK. So let's go ahead and get started with a little bit of background about who Connect Plus actually are. So they're different from a lot of our traditional customers, uh, the DOTs and government agencies, in that they are a private company um, and they're managing a small particular section of the roadway. Um, they're a public-private partnership or Triple P, that's contracted by Highways England, um, formerly Highway Agency, um, and they received that contract to do so in May of 2009. They're not just a single company, but they're instead a joint venture that's comprised of uh, numerous stakeholders, but four of the main players being some companies that you've probably heard of, uh, Balfour Beatty, Skanska, Atkins, and Aegis projects. And the contract is a 30-year design, build, finance, and operate contract, or DBFO for short. So a little bit more about Connect Plus. Um, at the time of it being awarded, it was the largest contract ever with Highways England, um, and it may still be, I'm actually not entirely sure, but it was uh, for 6.2 billion pounds, um, or at the time that would have been around 10 billion dollars. Uh, much of this funding went towards a motorway widening project out to four lanes, um, and that took place through 2014. Um, and after that, they were left with about 1.2 billion pounds for asset renewals um, for the remainder of the contract. So let's take a look at what that actually covers. So the M25 is the orbital ring around London, much like the orbital rings we have here in the States. Um, you can see the blue circle is encompassing the city. Um, it includes that and also the stubs and tails, which are the secondary roads intersecting it throughout. Um, along with that, they also um, cover all the slip roads, so the ramps, um, all the roundabouts, and service roads, additionally. The M25 covers or contains 15% of all the daily traffic in the UK, so it's actually quite a vital piece of the country as a whole. And it also provides access to four uh, major airports, international airports around London. So you have London Heathrow, Stansted, northeast. So by the numbers, obviously this contract doesn't just include the roadway, but all the assets that fall along it. There's 400 kilometers of roadway, or about 250 miles, um, 1,700 structures, 760 bridges, one cable stayed bridge, uh, the Queen Elizabeth II bridge, which is shown in the picture here, um, crosses the Thames River on the eastern portion of the network. There's 8,000 signs, 40 kilometers of footways, 380 kilometers of drainage, and most importantly to this presentation, there's five tunnels with about 14,000 mechanical and electrical assets. So going further into the contract, um, it of course doesn't just say, here's a road, maintain it how you want for the next 30 years. It has certain requirements that they need to meet. Each asset category has some kind of requirement that's uh, attached to it, but for tunnels and m and &E, it's pretty straightforward. Um, in addition to maintaining a safe and reliable network or standard for the life of the contract. They also need to meet condition threshold um, that's set out at the beginning. And we'll get into what that means in a few more slides, but this is called the handback requirements. So basically, as we mentioned before, Connect Plus is a private company um, with private investors. So their objective is going to be a little bit different to DOTs. Traditionally, DOTs will receive a certain budget and they're trying to maximize their condition within that budget. Connect Plus, however, has a goal to minimize their expenditure while meeting that minimum condition obligation that they owe to the HE. So basically, they want to return a profit to all their stakeholders. So next, let's go ahead and get into some detail about how the condition is actually defined for tunnel and m &E assets and what conditions they must meet. So over the first few years of the contract, all the tunnel and m and &E assets were assessed, and they were given a baseline condition. So they went through, looked at every single, all 
of the 14,000 assets and gave them a condition on a scale from 1A to 5E, 1A being the best, 5E being the worst. Then with all those assets scored, the total condition of the entire structure was calculated using a weighted average um, from those individual assets. So the weighting was determined by ranking the importance of these individual assets um, from a scale of very high to low, and then obviously um, that's rolled up and given an average for the entire structure. This was defined as the Condition Performance Index, or CPI. So a little bit more into the actual contractual requirements. Um, with all the as assets uh, assessed and scored and the baseline condition established, uh, we can now set a standard for what the network should look like at the end of the 30-year contract. So this is where the handback criteria that I mentioned comes into play. And it's basically just that. At the end of 30 years, Connect Plus needs to return all of their assets in this condition that was assessed as the baseline condition at the beginning. A little chart down here illustrates this. So you can see in the first couple years, they were spent assessing those conditions. The green line is the actual inspected condition that took place, or will take place, I suppose, for most of it um, over the life of the contract. And you can see it goes above and below, which is fine. They're not actually tied to staying underlying or under that condition the entire time, so long as at the end of 30 years, it comes back around and is roughly in the same condition that they received it in. And note that this isn't necessarily the same case for all assets. For pavement, for instance, um, they can't pass a certain threshold at any given month or else they're penalized in that month. But um, for the purpose of this presentation and for M&E, uh, this is the main constraint of the contract. So now that we know about Connect Plus and what they've set out to do, uh, let's go into some details about how they're actually going out and inspecting these assets and collecting the conditions that they're required to meet. Um, we know our, our obligations, we have our baseline conditions, and we know how many assets we have, so how do we set ourselves up for success? Uh, the first thing to do is to build an inventory of all the assets. So a lot of this was obviously done during the initial collection of the condition for the um, baseline scores. So they basically knew where all the assets were and that combined with legacy data from the HE that was provided by them. But still we need to uh, compile this data into a central location and manage it and keep it up to date. And, yes? Um, so I'll actually get into that in a slide, but um, yes, they, they manage the inspections or outsource them. Yeah, the, the DBFO is basically you've become the highway agency for the next 30 years. Uh, and I believe pretty much the only role that the HE has is oversight of them. Um, so yeah, they, we've built the inventory and of course this is stored in Agile Assets. So next, after we've established the inventory, we need to make an inspection schedule and assign inspections to these inventory records. So this means determining priorities uh, for what needs inspected and how often. And then if some assets are, some are, sorry, some assets are more important than others, how do we assign our inspections to cover this situation? Um, lastly, we need to actually go out and perform these and report the findings. So as Phil said, uh, we need to determine whether or not the inspection will be performed internally, uh, whether Connect Plus is going to send people out or they're going to outsource it to a third party company. And we need to take those completed inspections and actually enter them into the bridge inspector module. And then lastly, we need to take these completed inspection reports and send them off to the HE. So let's uh, dig into these three tasks just a little bit further. Building an inventory. So when Connect Plus started building their tunnel and m inventory, um, they had already established a structure inventory which included all of the structures that fall outside of that. So um, their regular bridges, culverts, mass, anything like that, which they define as their civil structures. Um, and with that, they already had a table structure in the database that tunnels and M&E needed to fit into. So you can see in the furthest left there, um, the existing structure inventory shows the structure at the top and then uh, the three levels below it. So span, element, which is basically just the categorization of the individual assets themselves which are defined as sub-elements, the actual asset. Um, tunnels and M&E have different attributes and are um, described a little bit differently, but it was pretty straightforward to make these match one-to-one. -one. So structure became tunnel, um, span obviously became span or bay, and then M&E category uh, tied up with element, and then the individual M&E asset was a sub-element. 
Um, on top of that, they need an additional layer of attributes to describe their tunnels in ME, um, so that it's simplified for the or simplified in the front end windows for the inspectors. So you'll see in a few slides why it was actually important, but this additional layer would be tunnel, um, then tunnel location, so something like bore A, bore B, so on and so forth. Asset subcategory, HVAC, fire safety, lighting, and then the actual asset within that category. All right. So we built up our inventory of 14,000 assets. Now what do we actually do with them? How are we going to go about actually inspecting them? Connect Plus established this process. Um, each year, all five tunnels, including all 14,000 assets, are inspected. So it's, it's quite straightforward and very comprehensive. Um, this is done on a recurring schedule of principal and general inspections. So you can see a little chart there. Um, general inspections take place in years one and two, and these are um, typically done internally. Um, so Connect Plus will send out their own people, and um, it provides condition scores for all those assets, but it's a little bit less detailed than their counterpart, the principal inspection, which is done in year three, and they will typically outsource this to a third-party company. Um, who go through their own processes, whatever that might be, but at the end of the day, they still enter it into the bridge inspector module. Um, yes, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, principal inspection covers everything general inspection does and more. It's just much more detailed. Um, and it provides a better view of the current defects that came up through that inspection. So the third part there is actually performing the inspection. Um, so basically, in in general, they'll send out teams of, this is Connect Plus process, uh, third party inspectors will have their own process, obviously. Um, they'll send out teams of five to 10 inspectors to the site for the duration of the inspection, so whatever that might be, a week, a um, few days, a couple weeks, depending on the size of the project. Um, so jumping back to the database structure, as I mentioned, the additional layer of attributes was important here because each of the inspectors is assigned a tunnel location and an asset subcategory. So that way, when they're going into the system and trying to enter the things that they did, it's much easier on the front end and just eases the data entry process. So moving on to that, upon completing the inspection, it's now up to the inspectors to actually get into Agile Assets and enter it into the Bridge Inspector module. So the third portion of the presentation here. So moving into the software, the first thing we need is a screen that maintains all the scheduled and active inspections. And this is the manage inspections window. So basically a supervisor or a manager can log in here and assign an inspector to a particular record or a company to a particular inspection record, set the dates, um, and check everything that's going on with that inspection as a whole. Um, they can also check the status of any of the inspections in this window. So you can see this little status column here with the red boxes. Um, it just kind of gives a quick and dirty view of is the inspection going according to the timeline that it's meant to? Um, you can see there's five red boxes there. We have five inspections that are behind. You need to find out what's going on there. Um, conversely, you can see the uh, submitted one. So this one's going through. It's purple. It's fine. Everything's good. Um, so the manager will go in, assign an inspection in this screen, and then that's where the data entry and the approval process will really start. So. Um, the first step is after it's been assigned, it'll go into the perform inspections window, and here's where the actual inspectors will get in, enter all the data that they collected, um, record all the defects, and make sure everything from the inspections put into the system here. From there, they'll submit that to the reviewer, where he can, he or she, can either modify, reject, or um, pass it on finally to the third part, which is the authorize inspections window, um, and then the final authorizer can give the stamp of approval, calculate the final condition scores, and generate any relevant reports. So taking a look at the most important window in that process is the perform inspections window. Um, the other screens, the review and authorize windows, are basically follow the same framework, but have the additional functionality of um, generating reports or rejecting or approving. Um, so some of the features that are used in this window, I'm gonna do a live demo after the PowerPoint here, so not actually showing much of the window itself, but just going over a few of the features. Um, first one is it shows only assigned inspections, which seems common sense, but um, a user can only see the inspections that they've been given. So if I log in as Tyler Pauly, I'm only gonna see Tyler Pauly inspections. This uh, keeps it clean and organized, because I think there's about 1,800 planned inspections, 
in the uh, system as a total. But if I log in, I only see the three that have been given to me. And it also prevents um, any third party companies from seeing any internal data that they don't want them to. Um, next thing is GIS slash LRS integrated. Um, so like a lot of the windows in the system, you can view any of the structures on a map um, just by right click, show on map. It's filled from the previous conditions. So if I create a new inspection record and go into the window, it will have all the asset condition data filled in from the inspection previous to it, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but if you have, yeah, I don't know, a thousand assets that you need to type in, you don't want to redo all the work over and over. So it helps the inspector to go in, change what needs to be changed, and then push it on, saving time. Uh, the next thing is, uh, oops, sorry. It, yes. Um, so the next is a uh, dynamic task list. Um, so the ME ME inspection requires a certain amount of tasks to be done. So you go through the checklist: has this been done? Does this have damage? So on and so forth. This window will dynamically show what the tasks are based off of the um, the asset category that you have selected. I'll show you that here in a few slides, actually. Uh, defect reporting. So within this window, if the inspector encounters any defects along the inspection process, you can report it against a particular asset in this window, and that's automatically assigned a work order and place it in the maintenance manager module. Then the last bit is um, automatic condition calculations. So as I mentioned before, the condition of the structure is defined as that weighted average, the CPI value, and um, the calculation is done here in this window by pressing a button. So. The, condi or the inspector will input all the individual asset conditions and then the system will calculate the CPIs. And then this is also done automatically through each step of the submission process. So um, from perform to review and when the reviewer submits it to the authorizer, it's also calculated again to account for any changes that they might have made. So looking at a couple of those features, just more in depth, um, you guys are all internal so you know the 7.1 GIS looks like. So I won't go into too much detail there, but yeah, we've uh, We've recently moved on to 7.1 there and uh, built that in, and it's looking good. Performance is better. Um, but another thing that some of you maybe haven't seen, uh, we built a street view link. So the data window that lists out the inspections also has this little field where you can click on it and it will pop up an external window and show you that structure on Google Street View. And it's a pretty uh, easy thing to do. You just take the coordinate values from the geometry, pass them as parameters into the URL, and it's there. It takes about two minutes. Uh, the next thing that I mentioned before were the dynamic task lists. So um, basically the window will change what fields are shown based off the category you have selected. We put this in a couple places in the system, but uh, the task list is probably the most important one. Um, so you can see here, here's a little example. Um, we have an asset selected that's in m and &E lighting, and this is the domestic external lighting system. And then down below we have about four drop downs, which are individual tasks that we need to check for this category. So you can see it's uh, luminaires are free from damage, lighting functions properly in each room, power outlets are free from damage, things like that. On the other hand, if we select a different category, so this one's fire safety, and it's a 4A cross passage door, I have no clue what that means, but whatever that is, <laughs> um, you can see it has a different task list. So panic bolt slash push bar, uh, no sign of damage, doors free from vision panels are fine. This is important because when you take all of the asset categories together, I'm not sure how many we have offhand, but at least dozens, and you put all the tasks, it would just be a massive window that the inspector is scrolling through looking for the proper fields to fill in. So it saves a lot of time and prevents them from putting things in the wrong spot. Okay, so we took a look at the perform inspection screen. Um, we filled in all of our tasks. We've recorded all of our defects and our conditions. And the next step is just completing the inspection cycle. So from a few slides ago, if you remember, the next step is submit it to the reviewer. Um, from there, the inspection or the reviewer can go in and uh, approve or reject it, essentially. If they reject it, they will enter a reason, it provides a pop-up, and an email alert is automatically sent from the system to the inspector saying, hey, look at this inspection, go back and fix it, and then pass it along again. If it's not rejected and it's okay, it's then passed on to the authorizer, and um, this is where the final person gets to uh, 
put the final stamp of approval. And once they press the approve button in the screen, a uh, few things happen. First of all, the final scores are calculated. So if the conditions were changed by the reviewer or by the authorizer at any point, it's making sure these scores are correct. Um, those are saved and then the inventory is updated. We have the most recent condition scores. Um, then automatically a PDF Jasper report is created and then attached to that record, the inspection record. Um, and the little thumbnail paperclip comes up and you can download it. And then lastly, the inspection is saved and the system will generate a new planned inspection record in the manage inspections window. So it'll look at whether or not this was a PI or a general inspection or a principal inspection. It'll look at the dates and then take their business rules and create a new record for it. Okay, so reporting. Um, I said that PDF Jasper report is created and saved. This is kind of going into um, what that report is. So Connect Plus required two different reports to be produced for M&E inspections. Um, these are created and submitted to Highways England once the inspection is complete. They have to upload them into a system called SMIS, which is basically Highway England's um, structure management information system, something along those lines. Um, but the first thing we have is the structure inspection report. These are both Jasper reports. Um, so this first one gives an overview of the structure condition, lists out, basically it's a detailed view of everything that happened in that inspection. So it'll list out um, every span, every element, um, and the structure as a whole, and list the conditions. Then on the bottom, it'll also show any defects that were reported in that inspection, and um, include any media, so any pictures that might have been associated with that defect. Uh, the next one is an M&E task report, which um, is another Jasper report, but this one's produced in Excel. And um, it basically spits out a record for every task that we saw there in those previous windows um, on every asset and the results of that task, which were typically just yes, no, NA. There's a little bit of a closer look at that report. So you can see that database structure that we talked about before. So we have span, element, sub-element, location, and um, Basically, the goal here was to have a turnkey process where you push the button and you can take the file and upload it to Smith directly. And pretty much no intervention, well, ideally, no intervention from the uh, engineer or the user. So for the last bit of the presentation here, or the PowerPoint, um, I was going to go over some of the future plans that Connect Plus is working on implementing. So um, I think these things are going to provide uh, good value to the business coming up in probably the next year or so. So the first thing is a mobile inspection platform. Um, this is something that Connect Plus is really big on from the beginning, and they've decided to kind of take the steps to develop their own solution uh, concurrently with us, uh, but um, perform or performing mobile inspections. So they're currently in the procurement phase and are finalizing things right about now. It might actually be done as I say this. So <laughs> Phil's shaking his head yes. Um, <laughs> the goal is to provide inspectors with handheld devices so that they can take them on site and input the inspections directly. So right now, obviously, we saw the perform inspections window. They're not taking out a tablet or a laptop or anything and putting it there directly. So they're repeating work. The goal is to have them take a device, go put it directly in, interface with our database, and um, cut out you know, the second step of the process there. And development for this is looking to begin later this year, hopefully actually really soon, um, or early next year. And they will be doing that on the FieldGo platform, which is a third-party um, company who specialize in customizable handheld applications for surveys and for on-site inspections. And the second upcoming feature um, for m &E will be um, using it with their decision support tools. So currently they use the bridge analyst module, and also the pavement analyst module, but um, as their DST decision support tool, and it helps them to produce their optimized work plans. Um, they're currently only doing this for the civil structures that I spoke about, so the non-tunnel and m and &E assets. Um, but at the end of the year, end of this year, they would like to also include M&E assets to be accommodated in the analysts. So um, much like the inventory, they'll need to take um, M&E assets, the tunnels, and make it fit into kind of the analytical framework that um, already exists for the civil structures. But this will also allow them to use the optimization tools across both of them, so create work plans that accommodate for both. Um, 
in that same realm, they're using the DST to produce their AMFP plans, which are asset management forward plans. I guess the P is redundant there. Um, these are basically their one, five, and 30 year visions for the network that they need to report to the AG periodically. Um, the one year is basically their work plan. It's the highly detailed real world projects that they plan on doing in the next year or so. Uh, five years, the medium term, um, kind of a good picture of what they plan on doing in the next coming years. And then the 30 year, which they've actually just started to complete um, for the first time using the DST, um, gives a very high level overview that helps them understand whether or not they're going to be able to meet those handback conditions that we talked about earlier. So are they going to have enough money or maybe they'll have enough money to give back as profit to the, uh, the stakeholders. So including m and &E assets in the DST will help provide a more comprehensive AMFP and uh, hopefully will help them optimize the work plans and save them money in the end. Uh, so they, light, they, they widen the motorway to four lanes in the first five years, um, and as far as I know, that's the only major construction project that will happen. They did um, a little bit of work with toll roads on the east, but um, as far as expansion, I don't think there's any plan. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, so basically, the handback is they have that.
How do I get it up there? Oh, no, no, it's fine. Continue. I'm trying to figure this out. So. <laughs> Just need to get the uh, browser up on there. I mean, yeah, it fits. Extend. He's extended. How do you extend the PC? Extend it to lost it and screen it to how do you? Duplicated to extend. No, 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 extend it. It is extended. That's the background. Is that what you want? You just want it on the side? Well, I need to be able to see it. Oh, okay. Well, duplicate it. Are they using it to track defects? Display settings? This is different. Oh, just uh, just just hit it. Just hit it. Just let it scoot it up. Go up. No, take that up. And then um, is this his presentation? Have some presentation or something else. It's a browser. presentation afterwards or uh no but this is the end. Okay. okay i mean my last bit here is just to kind of go through that process that i described so if you want to continue discussion do that as well that's all okay um yeah so um i'm just going to walk you through the inspection process that i showed kind of those uh the manage instruction or manage screen and then take it through the approval process so First thing we have here is the manage inspection screen. And this is the one I showed where the manager and supervisor can create inspections, assign them, so on and so forth. So let's just uh, make myself a new record here. So I think it's the structure key. Okay. So yeah, we're going to use the Dartford West tunnel here for our inspection. Choose M&E um, principal inspection for our type and assign it to me. And here you can see there's also fields for third party inspector, inspector group, reviewer, whatever the manager needs to put in to uh, set the details. And then I'll also set myself as the reviewer. Save. And then once I've saved that record, it'll become available in the perform inspection screen. Uh oh. That's not good. I, just, I, just, I swear I just did this like a half hour. <laughs> you all work here. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Well, there we go. I don't know why that happened. Um, but yeah, you can see my one record's available. So we cut down the list from 1,900 to one. Um, a few of the features that we saw before. So. Um, this one's actually a copy of our dev environment, so I haven't set up the new GIS in that yet, but production is good. Um, they did formerly have a map tab here, so you can click on that, and apparently throws us into the middle of the ocean. Um, and we also have uh, the street view, street view link. It's because I just updated the geometry for 7.1. Um, the street view link, there we go, throws us right into the middle of the tunnel. So I'm going to check out before that. Um, 
then we have a media tab where you can attach any of the or, um, attach any files to it. Um, the overview of the screen here is the inspection summary. So this is where you're going to see all the details for it. Um, most of those are grayed out. You just can't really tell on the projector right now. Um, first thing we need to do is enter inspection date and confirm the inventory. And then this will populate all the inspection tables from or with all the assets from the inventory tables. And then really getting into what the inspector needs to do, goes into inspection detail, and he can drill down and start entering all the condition scores with individual assets. So here you can see this is quite a massive structure. We have nine civil spans there, and then all of these M&E spans, which um, are building services, electrical power, fire safety, things like that. Um, when we click on one of these and then go to the sub-element scores, it'll list out all of the individual assets for that span. So here you can see we have, within that span, we have, uh, oh, sorry, lighting, HVAC, uh, CCTV camera, small power, everything. It's very detailed. That's how they got the 14,000 assets across just five tunnels. Um, so we click on all. We start entering our 1A to 5E score into these. Um, this one didn't have a previous inspection, or else it would have been filled in, as I mentioned before. Um, we don't necessarily need to enter all of them. We'll just do a few here so it can calculate some uh, condition scores. Yeah. And then in the pane down below here, we can associate a defect with the sub-element we have selected above. So we right-click, insert, um, we say this defect. So they'll, they won't do the data input this part in the field. They'll, they'll do it however the process might be. They might go out with paper, um, figure it out. Yes. Yeah. So, so the, the goal of the mobile solution is actually probably make this window redundant or obsolete. But um, it will still be there for correcting things when you come back and actually going through the approval process. Um, but yeah, for now, um, they take out, I believe it's still pen and paper for, uh, for internal. And then some of the third party companies might be using their own little tablet solutions, but um, they still need to come back and do this. Um, so they enter it all in, um, record a defect here. You can see it's already, it's created a work request number down there below. Um, fill in all the relevant fields. What defect is this? Uh, I don't know, there's a problem with the paint. Save that. Um, and then the next step would be to go through the task list. So I mentioned the dynamic windows that we have. Um, here is the ME inspection task. So here we have selected the HVAC, um, and then this is the extract fan in room number three. Um, so you go through, check that each of these are fine, so on and so forth. Um, jump back. If we choose a different type of element now, we go to lighting you can see our task list has changed. A little bit of clever trickery on the back end. <laughs> Five minutes. All right, so I enter all that, save. <laughs> you can uh, enter all your comments, what have you. Um, you jump back to the inspection summary, and here you're going to submit it on to the reviewer. And Oh, it's interesting, because oh, I already did that earlier. So now it's going to calculate all those blank fields that we have, and we'll be able to see those in the review screen once we jump over there. We also could have just pressed the calculate button that was beside that, but I didn't want to wait for it to calculate twice. That's quite a big structure. We might actually be here until the, <laughs> the end of the presentation. <laughs> yes? But basically, yeah, well, the cell color in one allows it when it opens up the data window to, like I said, it's trickery. So. <laughs> um, I, I don't, yeah.
Uh, I do not know. Um, yeah. the rest of the process I'll just uh, I'll generate the uh, report so we can see how that works. So yeah, I pressed the publish inspection report, it added an attachment here, download this, and this is the first one that I mentioned, the PDF that shows um, the whole detail of the entire inspection. I zoom out a little bit, scroll down. And yeah, so it details every span, every element within that span, and gives the condition for those. It's quite massive. And then all the M&E spans as well. Um, and then down on the bottom, this is about as big as it gets, because it's a, a massive structure. And then our defects and work required. If we had attached a picture to that, it would also be showing that right below there. And then the other report in the last minute here is the M&E report. Yes, they do, because they, they've gone through all the pages and found little errors on like page 80 that I made, so. <laughs> and the, those PDFs are uploaded to um, the HE's structure management system, so they take those and put them into the stop 